Okay, there was something about being a research chemist, about the corporate chief research chemist, which I can tell you. That's a very old story. That's from Los Alamos day. Okay. Let's see, what else, though? And then there was a time I was asked to be the chief head of a big laboratory for research in rockets. Mm -hmm. Rocket uh, airplanes. Rocket airplanes. Rocket propelled airplanes. Oh, nuclear rocket propelled airplanes. Wow. Yes, sir. That's what it was. Okay. Okay, so I'll tell those two stories. That sounds good. Okay. Yeah, this is, and you really... Uh, we you... just have to take a minute to think of the order in which I tell this. Well, I think the... During the Depression, when I just got out of college, it was hard to get a job. I had some letters from Professor Morse and so on saying that I was pretty good in physics and I should get a job. And uh, one possibility was the Bell Telephone Company, but they didn't want me for that summer. So I went around in New York looking for a job, and the only possibility that were open for physicists in those days was the Bausch & Laum Optical Company, for instance. And they wanted men to design lenses to work the rays through the glass. And that's what physicists were used for. It's the only thing they knew to use them for. Otherwise, I might get a job in the electrical testing laboratory, testing electrical equipment. That's because I had stuff. studied electrical engineering. Well, I wasn't getting either of those jobs. I mean, although there were a few of them, I didn't get them. Mm. But a friend of mine, by the name of Bernie Walker, he was a kid with me when I was about 11 and 12. We were both scientifically minded. We went to school together. We were very good friends. He and I sort of grew up together scientifically. And he had a laboratory and I had a laboratory. And we often played together and talked about problems in science and discussed things together. In fact, we had a magic show one time. We used to put magic shows on for the kids, chemistry magic. And we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of tricks, you know, turning water colors and stuff like that, you know, wine to water and all this. But he was a pretty good showman, and I kind of liked that too, so he put on a good show. And on each side of the little table were two Bunsen burners with what we call watch glass plates, you know, flat glass plates rounded on stands, which had iodine on it. When you're heating up, it made iodine vapor, which is a purple vapor, which is very beautiful. Coming up on each side, you see, while well, the whole show went on. <laughs> then the finale of the show, the very last thing, we had discovered something. If I put my hands first in a sink of water, and then into benzene, then I could accidentally, make believe it was accidentally, I'd put my hand in the flame of the iodine thing, and my hands would light up. I'd touch them together, and they would both be burning. They're burning the benzene, but it doesn't hurt your hand because it goes out pretty fast and the water keeps it cool. So I wave my hands around, and the fire, fire, and everybody get all excited because my hands are burning and they all run out. And that was the finale <laughs> of the show. Uh, by the way, I later told that story when I was in a fraternity and the guys said, that's a lot of baloney. It's a lot of nonsense. You can't do that. So I said, all right, guys, let's go out and get some benzene, and I'll show you how it works. And so they got the benzene ready, and I stuck my hand in the water in the sink and put it in the benzene and lit it, and it hurt like hell. Because in the meantime, I had grown hairs, which acted like <laughs> wicks, which held the benzene in place while it burned, you see. Whereas when I had done it earlier, I had not had any hairs on the back of my head. After I did this experiment burning my hands, I didn't have any hairs on the back of my hand either. And I used it up. <laughs> That's incidental. <laughs> okay, well, this guy, Bernie, met me just about that time on the beach and told me that he had a process for metal plating plastics. And I said that was impossible because there's no conductivity, but you can't attach a wire. And he said he could metal plate anything. And I still remember picking up a peach pit that was in the sand <laughs> and saying he could metal plate that and trying to impress me. He impressed me. But he was nice as that he offered me a job working there as the chief research chemist for his little company, the metal plated plastics, which was in the top floor of a building in New York. There were only about four people in the company. He was a vice president. His father was the one who was getting the money together and was, I think, the president. And he had somebody else partner with him or something who was also a salesman. And I think there were just four people. Plus Bernie's brother, who was not very clever, but a bottle washer. And my friend Walker had this process for metal plating plastics. And the scheme was first to deposit silver on the object by precipitating silver from a bath like you make mirrors, a silver nitrate bath with a reducing agent. The silver is a conductor, and then you stick that in an electroplating bath, and it plates the silver. Problem was, does the silver plate hold on? 
And it doesn't when you do that. It peels off again easily. But he had discovered that for things like Bakelite, which is an important plastic in those days, one of the early plastics, if he sandblasted it first, then it would hold good. Oh, yes, there was another step in between. Let me think. It was a re Oh, yeah, he had to soak it for many hours in stannous chloride or something like that, which is also a reducing agent, which got into the pores of the Bakelite somehow after he'd sandblasted the surface. And then the stuff would hold when he made the reduction. It held onto the surface very nicely. And when you made the plate, it held. But it only worked on a few plastics. All the plastics at the time were those were all just coming out plastics, and there were different kinds of plastics. The methyl methacrylate, which we call plexiglass now, was one that we couldn't plate at first. And cellulose acetate, which is a cheap plastic in those days used a lot, we couldn't plate at first. But we had discovered that we could, by putting cellulose acetate and sodium hydroxide for a little while, then when we did this process, it would plate very hard. And I did pretty well on this place. The advantage, he had done no chemistry on it. He had done no experimenting. He just knew how to do it once. And so I was able in the summer to do a few things. And I was no chemist, of course. By just putting lots of different knobs in bottles and putting all different chemicals in and trying everything, I found ways of doing a, a wider range of plastics than he had done before so that the plate would stick. In addition, I got the reduction you see, what happened is when he reduced the silver from the silver nitrate, he'd only get a certain percentage. The rest of the silver would go in the bath and be left in solution and so forth. And so he had a whole system which he was going to have the people who he licensed the process send back the silver nitrate so he could recover the silver. But I changed the reducing agent by just looking up in the books about reducing agents. And I changed the reducing agent, I think from glucose to formaldehyde or something. And 100% of the silver would come out. Absolutely. And what was left was so empty of silver, there was no need to recycle anything. It simplified the process. I also discovered that the stannous chloride or oxide or whatever it was that we were using didn't dissolve very well in water. But I had remembered from some chemistry I learned that slightly hydrochloric acid dissolves very well. So I changed them. Just a little bit of hydrochloric acid. And I made that step that used to take hours, operated in about five minutes. So I, I simplified that and I did several things. So I was a success as a chemist, you see. And the way I did all the chemistry was, you know, lots of bottles and lots of radio knobs and so <laughs> on. We were always being interrupted because the salesman would come back with some project he's trying to sell to somebody. And they would ask him, well, let me see if you can plate this. So I'd have all these bottles lined up and everything marked and the timing and everything on each of the things. And all of a sudden, no, you got to stop this to do this super job for the sales department. So many experiments had to be started more than once. Uh, I remember one time we got into one hell of a lot of trouble. There was some person who was trying to make a picture for a cover of a magazine about automobiles. And he had built out of plastic very carefully. He was an artist for the cover. A wheel with a round hub and everything. Beautiful. Out of plastic. And somehow or other, the salesman had told him that we could metal plate anything. And we wanted us to metal plate the central hub. So it was a shiny silver hub, okay? So it was a new plastic that we didn't know very well how to do. The fact is the salesman never knew what we could do, so he was always promising me. <laughs> so we tried to metal plate this thing and something went bad on it. And the metal plating was uneven. There was spots where there was no plating. So we wanted to fix it up and we had to get the old silver off and we couldn't get the old silver off. So we decided to use concentrated nitric acid to dissolve it. Result, of course, is we made pits and holes and we screwed up the plastic and we were really in hot water that time. <laughs> we had lots of hot water experiments. <laughs> anyway, you have to visualize this place. It's just this little loft on this kind of experimenting and this type of thing. I remember the time we dropped the bottle of great big carboy of ammonia water, you know, liquid ammonium hydroxide, and the whole place was full of ammonia. We were trying to clean it up and throwing acid on it to get the ammonia back. So that's that. And I left later to go back to school or to go to Princeton, I don't know what. And I don't think I'll bother you with what happened to the company afterwards. But anyway, we went, that would have tell you what happened. What happened was that uh, right after I left, they got a good offer from somebody who really wanted to do it, to metal plate pens, plastic pens to be metal plated, so that people could have silver pens that were light and easy and cheap, relatively cheap, and they looked nice. And so they had done this. And uh, they were making these things, but he hadn't enough experience with the pen material, the plastic, 
what happened is the darn things would develop a little blister or something where it start to peel. And when you have something in your hand that has a little blister that starts to peel, you can't help piddling with it. Everybody was piddling with all the peeling was coming off of all the pens. <laughs> and so it was, you know, it wasn't very good. So I had this emergency problem to fix the pens. And my friend was a little bit of a bull thrower. He liked to build things up. So he decided he needed a big microscope and everything. He cost the company, his own company, a lot of money for fake research. Yeah. That he's researching into this, studying it with a microscope and so on. But he didn't know what the hell he's going to look at or why. So I think what it was was simply that in making plastics at that time and still, they use a thing called a filler. That is, they fill the volume of place or the weight with some other innocuous material. Sometimes the dye, it's got something else in it called fillers. And the fillers are not very well controlled in those days. They didn't always do exactly the same way. You take some rag paper and grind it up. It's black since they didn't have to worry about the color because we're going to metal plate it. It's black anyway, so they threw that in along with the black dye, and the thing wasn't always the same. And I think what happened was that some of the stuff in the filler caught some of our material, like one of our processes, is perhaps the tin or sodium hydroxide or whatever, it was, and left it under the surface of the silver, and it started this thing getting loose or something like that. Anyway, the result is they had trouble. They never solved that problem, and the company failed mm. because their first job was such a failure. I don't know how much money the guy with the pens lost in the process. But yeah. It was rather exciting for a while to see people walking around with pens. Lots. It was very popular. It was immediately sold all over, and you could see people with these pens, and you knew where they came from. Mm. But very soon, nobody wanted them anymore. Yeah. So it was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, many years later, when I was in, not many years later, three, four years later, I was in Los Alamos. And there was a man who was a sort of scientist, but more, he was also very good at administrating. He seemed, and he very energetic and worked very hard. And his name is Frederick de Hoffman. And he's the same guy, opened the safe for and so forth. And he later became the vice president of General Atomics or the president or something like that. He was a big industrial character afterwards. But at the time, he was just an energetic, very energetic, open-eyed, enthusiastic boy helping along with this project, you see, as best he could. Not very highly trained, but liked mathematics and worked very hard. He compensated for his lack of training by hard work, and uh, he was really quite useful for that. But one day, we're eating lunch in a fuller lodge. He had come from England. He had been working in England. And I had never asked him before what he was doing in England. And he says to me, I was working on a process for metal plating plastics. And we were developing this in our laboratory. I was one of the guys working there, metal plating the plastics. And he said, we were working on this process. And we were going along pretty good. It was pretty good. But it was no use. I said, why? He says, because this is we're beginning to develop it. There's this company in New York. I said, what company in New York? There's a company in New York called the Metaplast Corporation, he says. And they would develop further. I said, how did you know that they would develop further? He says, because they were advertising all the time in Modern Plastics magazine. They had these full-page advertisements and all the pictures of the things they could plate and so forth. And they were so neat looking and all. And uh, we realized that we weren't along as far as then. Americans are, you know, real more active and so forth. And we were sure, knew that they were way ahead of us. So I said, well, did you have any stuff from there? No, but you could tell from the advertisements. They were way ahead of what we could do. Our process was pretty good, but it was no use trying to compete with an American process like that. I said, well, how many guys you have working? He said, we had six chemists working. I said, well, how about those guys? Maybe they didn't have as much chemists. No, he says, I'm sure from looking at it, they must have had about 25, 50 chemists. A real chemistry department. I said, would you describe to me what you think the chief research chemist of that corporation might look like <laughs> and how the thing worked? So he described, he says, one of us have been, like, I would guess this guy probably had his own office, especially with glass. Well, you know how to have in the movies. These guys all coming in all the time with research projects they're doing, you know, working on different plastics and trying to get the plate to say, <laughs> And all coming in and out, he's giving advice. And I'm sure they were way ahead of us with 25, 50 chemists. How the hell can we compete with him? <laughs> I said, well, you'll be interested to know that you are now talking to the chief research chemist of the Metaplast Corporation. <laughs> and let me describe to you the laboratory. Oh, no. So I described the knobs and the dopey bottle washer that we had. One guy... <laughs> And the chief research chemist was a physicist, <laughs> only a kid at the time. <laughs> wow.
Great. Yeah, that was that story. All right? Yeah. No.